This is a neat point about learning and where knowledge is stored. Knowledge is stored both in our biology, in terms of our instincts, maybe, our psychology, but it's also packed in, in in our brains in terms of knowledge that we have created or learned from other people or from books or whatever. Uh, this is on page 230. The brain does much more than recollect. It compares, synthesizes, analyzes, generates abstractions. We must figure out much more than our genes can know. That is why the brain library is some 10,000 times larger than the gene library. Our passion for learning, evident in the behavior of every toddler, is the tool for our survival. Emotions and ritualized behavior patterns are built deeply into us. They are part of our humanity, but they are not characteristic, characteristically human. Many other animals have feelings. What distinguishes our species is thought. The cerebral cortex is a liberation. We need no longer be trapped in the genetically inherited behavior patterns of lizards and baboons. We are, each of us, largely responsible for what gets put into our brains, for what, as adults, we wind up caring for and knowing about. No longer at the mercy of the reptile brain, we can change ourselves. You may know that Aristotle made this point, that what is human is actually our capacity to think, our minds. That is what makes us different than other animals. Everything else that we have is found in other animals. But what makes us different is this, and how profoundly different it makes us. If you just look around, you know, what, are the, what are the achievements of the common bird or the common lizard? There are no achievements. Their day-to-day -day activities are make babies and survive as, as an individual in their, in their small lifespan. But all they do is basically reproduce. They don't make, there's no kingdom of lizards, right? There are, the best, maybe the best example might be ant colonies. However, I don't know how long they last either. Beehives, there's something like that in terms of structures or bird nests. But there are no kingdoms. Uh, there's no, there's certainly no intellectual history. So that's how profoundly different the mind makes a species. But it's, I guess the that point is important. The other point is that our roots lie in that history, that genetic determinism, that biological determinism, that um, no free will, that we are, that our survival depended at, at, for a long time on this very, uh, these behavioral patterns that are, are fused or hardwired. Now that we have reached a kind of consciousness that gives us some capacity for choice and thought and rationality. Now we have a different kind of existence. We no longer can depend on those instincts. We have to clothe ourselves and we don't have big claws, we don't have fur, we don't have all kinds of things that animals have to kind of cheat reality. We have to engage in productive effort to survive very different than other animals who merely run a program. And continuing on that point on page 232, when the time came, perhaps 10,000 years ago, when we needed to know more than could conveniently be contained in brains, so we learned to stockpile enormous quantities of information outside our bodies. We are the only species on the planet, so far as we know, to have invented a communal memory stored neither in our genes nor in our brains. The warehouse of that memory is called the library. Books break the shackles of time, proof that humans can work magic. So it's, I guess the, the basic point here is that we can start to accumulate knowledge not just through memory, like you may know about oral histories of many cultures, uh, native cultures, indigenous, indigenous cultures around the world. Don't write things down, don't write books. Their stories are contained in myths and are just spoken and hopefully maybe 90, 95% of it is contained in the next generation and just in memory. But again, of course, that system breaks down, but um, that's why they're called myths. But um, that, if we can write stuff down, that stuff doesn't change as long as the material that it's written in, it doesn't decompose. And especially now with, that may have been a problem in the Library of Alexandria, for example, especially with copiers uh, who wouldn't copy everything correctly. 
And of course, the papyrus could break down or the whole library could get burned down as, as of what occurred. But now with the internet and digital storage, it would seem that that problem is now gone. So our brain, we're, I guess what we're doing is through technology, we are expanding our capacity for knowledge. Um, at one point, we were stuck with our genetics and our genes could only hold so much information, as we see with the production of other animals. Our brains hold a certain amount of information, which some animals have, and we have the most of, but eventually we even transcend our brains, even though apparently we still don't use as much of our brains as we could, but we then also inscribe information on materials, which again expands our minds even further. Um, I don't know what would be next if you, if you kept going in this process. What would be the next thing? I have no idea. I think, and just to kind of, as an anecdote, um, or a tangent, I guess. I think a problem, a massive problem today is that we, we inscribe so much information, but we spend so much little time organizing it and uh, digesting it, uh, considering it, and figuring out what to do with it. Like you even consider, just consider the academic world. Forget the blogosphere. Forget the amount of YouTubes made every day, uh, or TED Talks, or whatever you want to say. Um, even just look at academia, the amount of journal journals and the number of articles published every year, number of books written, there is so much information that is produced and so little of it read. Um, I don't, the, the, the statistics on how many people actually read academic articles is so minuscule. It's, it's, a, it's almost like the government is financing the production of waste. Um, so little is profound that is produced. And yet, it the, we have this university engine, right, producing all this stuff. So again, I think the, f the future would needs to think about some way of organizing and automatizing uses for research and knowledge. In a sense, I think in the future there would need to be people. There needs to be researchers, and many people with PhDs are really just researchers. There needs to be, there needs to bring back the ancient idea of the Renaissance man kind of thing. A person who may engage in some study, uh, some research, I mean, which is the production of new ideas. But really, the Renaissance man is the one who, who absorbed it all and did something with it. That, I think, is a rare quality. A rare quality even in academia. Mostly, actually, it's public intellectuals who do that, not academia. Mostly they're researchers. They chase government grants and they produce research. Very few of them are actually putting them into practice, um, making something that can be used in industry or um, teaching or whatever it might be. So.